Chapter One of Bertram Cope's Year. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Bertram Cope's Year by Henry Blake Fuller. Chapter One Cope at a College Tea. What is a man's best age? Peter Ibbotson, entering dreamland with complete freedom to choose, chose twenty-eight, and kept there. But twenty-eight, for our present purpose, has a drawback. A man of that age, if endowed with ordinary gifts and responsive to ordinary opportunities, is undeniably a man, whereas what we require here is something just a little short of that. Wanted, in fact, a young male who shall seem fully adult to those who are younger still, and who may even appear the accomplished flower of virility to an idealized maid or so, yet who shall elicit from the middle-aged the kindly indulgence due a boy. Perhaps you will say that even a man of twenty-eight may seem only a boy to a man of seventy. However, no septuagenarian is to figure in these pages our elders will be but in the middle forties and the earlier fifties and we must find for them an age which may evoke their friendly interest and yet be likely to call forth besides that their sympathy and their longing admiration and later their tolerance their patience and even their forgiveness i think then that bertram cope when he began to intrigue the little group which dwelt among the quadruple avenues of elms that led to the campus in Churchton, was but about twenty-four, certainly not a day more than twenty-five. If twenty-eight is the ideal age, the best is all the better for being just a little ahead. Of course, Cope was not an undergraduate, a species upon which many of the Churchtonians languidly refused to bestow their regard. They come and they go, said these prosperous and comfortable burghers, and after all, they're more or less alike, and more or less unrewarding. Besides, the bigger town, with all its rich resources and all its varied opportunities, lay but an hour away. Churchton lived much of its real life beyond its own limits, and the student who came to be entertained socially within them was the exception indeed. No, Bertram Cope was not an undergraduate. He was an instructor, and he was working along, in a leisurely way, to a degree. He expected to be an M.A., or even a Ph.D. Possibly a Lit. D. might be within the gift of later years, but anyhow nothing was finer than writing, except lecturing about it. Why haven't we known you before? Medora T. Phillips asked him at a small reception. Mrs. Phillips spoke out loudly and boldly, and held his hand as long as she liked. No, not as long as she liked, but longer than most women would have felt at liberty to do. And besides, speaking loudly and boldly, she looked loudly and boldly, and she employed a determined smile which seemed to say, I'm old enough to do as I please. Her brusque informality was expected to carry itself off, and much else besides. "'Of course I simply can't be half so intrepid as I seem,' it said. "'Everybody about us understands that, and I must ask your recognition, too, for an ascertained fact.' "'Known me?' returned Cope promptly enough. "'Why, you haven't known me because I haven't been here to be known.' He spoke in a ringing, resonant voice, returning her unabashed pressure with a hearty good will and blazing down upon her through his clear blue eyes with a high degree of self-possession even of insouciance and he explained with a liberal exhibition of perfect teeth that for the two years following his graduation he had been teaching literature at a small college in wisconsin and that he had lately come back to alma mater for another bout i'm after that degree he concluded haven't been here she returned but you have been here you must have been here for years for four anyhow so why haven't we she began again 
Here as an undergraduate, yes, he acknowledged. Unregarded dust, dirt beneath your feet, in rainy weather. Mud. Mud? echoed Medora Phillips loudly, with an increased pressure on his long, narrow hand. Why, Babylon was built of mud, of mud bricks, anyway. And the hanging gardens. She still clung, looking up his slopes, terrace by terrace. Cope kept his self-possession, and smiled brilliantly. "'Gracious,' he said, no less resonant than before. "'Am I a landscape garden? Am I a stage setting? Am I a—' Medora Phillips finally dropped his hand. "'You're a wicked, unappreciative boy,' she declared. "'I don't know whether to ask you to my house or not. "'But you may make yourself useful in this house, at least.' Run along over to that corner and see if you can't get me a cup of tea. Cope bowed and smiled and stepped toward the tea table. His head once turned, the smile took on a wry twist. He was no squire of dames, no frequenter of afternoon receptions. Why the deuce had he come to this one? Why had he yielded so readily to the urgings of the professor of mathematics, himself urged in turn, perhaps by a wife for whose little affair one extra man at the opening of the fall season counted, and counted hugely. Why must he now expose himself to the boundless aplomb and momentum of this woman of forty-odd, who was finding amusement in treating him as a college boy? Boy, indeed, she had actually called him. Well, perhaps his present position made all this possible. He was not yet out in the world on his own. In the background of down-state was a father with a purse in his pocket and a hand to open the purse. Though the purse was small and the hand reluctant, he must partly depend on both for another year. If he were only in business, if he were only a broker or even a salesman, he should not find himself treated with such blunt informality and condescension as a youth. If within the university itself he were but a real member of the faculty, with an assured position and an assured salary, he should not have to lie open to the unceremonious hectorings of the socially confident, the placed. He regained his smile on the way across the room, and the young creature behind the samovar, who had had a moment's fear that she must deal with severity, found that a beaming affability, though personally unticketed in her memory, was, after all, her happier allotment. In her reaction she took it all as a personal compliment. She could not know, of course, that it was but a piece of calculated expressiveness fitted to a particular social function, and doubly overdone as the wearer's own reaction from the sprouting indignation of the moment before. She hoped that her hair, under his sweeping advance, was blowing across her forehead as lightly and carelessly as it ought to, and that his taste in marquise rings might be substantially the same as hers. She faced the quite unknown, and asked it sweetly, One lump or two? The dickens, how do I know? he thought. An extra one on the saucer, please, he said aloud, with his natural resonance, but slightly hushed, and his blue eyes, clear and rather cold and hard, blazed down, in turn, on her. Why, what a nice, friendly fellow! exclaimed Mrs. Phillips, on receiving her refreshment. Both kinds of sandwiches, she continued, peering round her cup. Were there three? she asked with sudden shrewdness. There were macaroons, he replied, and there was some sort of layer cake. It was too sticky. These are more sensible. Never mind sense. If there is cake, I want it. Tell Amy to put it on a plate. Amy? Yes, Amy. My Amy. Your Amy? Off with you, parrot, and bring a fork, too. Cope lapsed back into his frown and recrossed the room. The girl behind the samovar felt that her hair was unbecoming, after all, and that her ring, borrowed for the occasion, was in bad taste. Cope turned back with his plate of cake and his fork. Well, he had been promoted from a boy to a fellow. But must he continue a kind of methodical dog-trot through a sublimated butler's pantry? That's right, declared Mrs. Phillips, on his return, as she looked lingeringly at his shapely thumb above the edge of the plate. 
Come, we will sit down together on this sofa, and you shall tell me all about yourself. She looked admiringly at his blue serge knees as he settled down into place. They were slightly bony, perhaps. But then, as she told herself, he is still quite young. Who would want him anything but slender, even spare, if need be? As they sat there together, she plying him with questions and he, restored to good humor, replying or parrying with an unembarrassed exuberance, a man who stood just within the curtained doorway and flicked a small graying mustache with the point of his forefinger, took in the scene with a studious regard. Every small educational community has its scholar manqué, its haunter of academic shades or its intermittent dabbler in their charms, and Basil Randolph held that role in Churchton. No alumnus himself, he viewed year after year the passing procession of undergraduates who possessed in their young present so much that he had left behind or had never had at all, and who were walking potentially toward a promising future in which he could take no share. Most of these had been commonplace young fellows enough, noisy, philistine, glaringly cursory and inconsiderate toward their elders, but a few of them, one now and then at long intervals, he would have enjoyed knowing, and knowing intimately. On these infrequent occasions would come a union of frankness, comeliness, and elan, and the rudiments of good manners. But no one in all the long-drawn procession had stopped to look at him a second time, and now he was turning gray. He was tragically threatened with what might in time become a paunch. His kind heart, his forth-reaching nature, went for naught, and the young men let him walk under the elms and the scrub oaks neglected. If they had any interest beyond their egos, their fraternities, and conceivably their studies, that interest dribbled away on the quadrangle that housed the girl students. If they only realized how much a friendly hand extended to them from middle life, might do for their futures, he would sometimes sigh. But the youthful egoists, ignoring him still, faced their respective futures, however uncertain, with much more confidence than he, backed by whatever assurances and accumulations he enjoyed, could face his own. To be young, he said, to be young. Do you figure Basil Randolph, alongside his poitiere, as but the observer, the raisonneur in this narrative? If so, you err. What, you may ask? A rival? A competitor? That more nearly. It was Medora Phillips herself who, within a moment or two, inducted him into this role. A gap had come in her chat with Cope. He had told her all he had been asked to tell, or all he meant to tell, at any rate, he had been given abundant opportunity to expatiate upon a young man's darling subject, himself. Either she now had enough fixed points for securing the periphery of his circle, or else she preferred to leave some portion of his area, now ascertained approximately within a poetic penumbra, or perhaps she wished some other middle-aged connoisseur to share her admiration and confirm her judgment. At all events... "'Oh, Mr. Randolph!' she cried. "'Come here!' Randolph left his doorway and stepped across. "'Now you are going to be rewarded,' said the lady, broadly generous. "'You are going to meet Mr. Cope. "'You are going to meet Mr.' she paused. "'Do you know,' turning to the young man, "'I haven't your first name. "'Why, is that necessary? "'You're not ashamed of it. "'Theodosius?' Philander? Hieronymus? Stop, please. My name is Bertram. Never. Bertram? Why not? Because that would be too exactly right. I might have guessed and guessed, right or wrong, Bertram's my name. You hear, Mr. Randolph? You are to meet Mr. Bertram Cope. Cope? who had risen and had left any embarrassment consequent upon the short delay to Basil Randolph himself, shot out a hand and summoned a ready smile. Within his cuff was a hint for the construction of his forearm. It was lean and sinewy, 
clear-skinned and with strong power for emphasis on the other's rather short well-fleshed fingers and as he gripped he beamed beamed just as warmly or just as coldly at all events just as speciously as he had beamed before for on a social occasion one must slightly heighten goodwill all the more so if one be somewhat unaccustomed and even somewhat reluctant mrs phillips caught cope's glance as it fell in all its glacial geniality he looks down on us she declared how down cope asked well you're taller than either of us i don't consider myself tall he replied five foot nine and a half he proceeded ingenuously is hardly tall it is we who are short said randolph but really sir rejoined cope kindly i shouldn't call you short what is an inch or two but how about me demanded mrs phillips why a woman may be anything except too tall responded cope candidly but if she wants to be stately well there was queen victoria you incorrigible i hope i'm not so short as that sit down again we must be more on a level and you mr randolph may stand and look down on us both i'm sure you have been doing so anyway for the past ten minutes by no means i assure you returned randolph soberly soberly for the young man had slipped in that sir and he had been so kindly about randolph's five foot seven and a bit over and he had shown himself so damnably tender toward a man fairly advanced within the shadow of the fifties a man who if not an acknowledged outcast from the joys of life would soon be lagging superfluous on their rim randolph stood before them looking no doubt a bit vacant and inexpressive please go and get amy mrs phillips said to him i see she's preparing to give way to someone else Amy, who was a blonde girl of twenty or more, came back with him pleasantly and amiably enough, and her aunt, or whatever she should turn out to be, was soon able to lay her tongue again to the syllables of the interesting name of Bertram. Cope, thus finally introduced, repeated the facial expressions which he had employed already beside the tea-table, but he added no new one, and he found fewer words than the occasion prompted, and even required. He continued talking with Mrs. Phillips, and he threw an occasional remark toward Randolph, but now that all obstacles were removed from free converse with the divinity of the samovar, he had less to say to her than before. Presently the elder woman, herself no whit offended, began to figure the younger one as a bit nonplussed. "'Never mind, Amy,' she said. "'Don't pity him, and don't scorn him.' he's really quite self-possessed and quite chatty or suddenly to cope himself have you shown us already your whole box of tricks that must be it he returned well no matter mr randolph can be nice to a nice girl oh come now well shall i ask you to my house after this no don't forbid it banish me give one more chance suggested randolph sedately why what's all this about said the questioning glance of amy if there was any offence at all on anybody's part it lay in making too much of too little take back my plate somebody said mrs phillips randolph put out his hand for it this sandwich said amy reaching for an untouched square of wheat bread and pimento i've been so busy with other people i'll take it myself declared mrs phillips reaching out in turn mr randolph bring her a nibble of something i might began cope you don't deserve the privilege oh very well he returned lapsing into an easy passivity never mind anyway said amy still without cognomen and connections i can starve with perfect convenience or i can find a mouthful somewhere later let us starve sitting said randolph here are chairs the hostess herself came bustling up brightly. "'Has everybody—' and she bustled away. "'Yes, everybody, almost,' said Mrs. Phillips to her associates, behind their entertainer's back. "'If you're hungry, Amy, it's your own fault. Sit down.' And there let us leave them, our little group, 
our cast of characters, everybody, almost, save one, or two, or three. End of chapter one. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.